You know, as I was thinking about um, what we wanted to share tonight, I was, couldn't help but kind of think about our culture these days. You know, with social media, with everything um, from Instagram to Facebook, Pinterest, I don't know. I mean, there's so many different apps out there, so many different things out there. Um, I feel like we kind of seem to think that we know people. Like, we kind of seem to think we know more about them than maybe we really do. Like, we see a few posts online, we see them in church holding, on to hand, holding hands, and then we kind of think we know their story. Like, we know that maybe, well, they've got it all together. I mean, did you see their vacation photos? Or did you see, um, <laughs> you know, but how many of you know on the other side of that, if you think about your own life, you know, how much does your social media profile, how much does that show an accurate picture of what your life looks like? It's probably not very close, is it? Like, are your church attendance, is that the full picture of who you are? I don't think so. But yet... Don't we all put on the good face when we come to church, right? Yeah. But you know what? We still put on these rose-colored glasses about everyone else's life. You know, we kind of look at other people through this lens, like they've got it all together. They can't relate to me. They don't know what I'm going through. We see, you know, we can scroll through and start to feel lonely. We can feel left out. We can feel like somebody doesn't understand us and that they don't get us. And because of this, you know, as again, as we were talking about tonight, one of the things that I was thinking about is I don't really think it's that much of a coincidence that one of the most popular shows that's on TV right now is a show called This Is Us. And I'll be honest, if you haven't seen it, that's okay, because I haven't seen it either. Neither have I. I've never seen it. <laughs> but I've heard enough, she I've seen it. just a glimpse of it that I think I kind of understand why people like it. I think that they like it because it looks real and it looks raw. It looks like something that they can relate to. It doesn't look like it's got this um, Snapchat filter that makes everything look pretty. You feel like um, they're really, I don't know, the writers seem to do a really good job of dealing with real life stuff, with hard topics, with real emotions that so many of us can relate to. And they kind of leave out those filters. They leave out some of that perfection, you know, I think a lot of us are ready for that r level of realness. Are you guys ready for that level of realness? I am. You know, and I think there's just so much information coming at us all the time, right? And so often that information is edited. It's touched up, it's prepackaged, and it's often delivered with some kind of agenda. And rarely are we able to feel like we can find honesty, like we, we can find authenticity. And when we do, I don't know about you, but I crave it. Right. As we sat in church here a few weeks ago and listened to John and Lisa Bevere, how many were here on Friday night when John and Lisa Bevere spoke? And they, okay. a week later... It's okay uh, if you weren't. Yeah, was <laughs> anyway. A week later, then uh, Pastors Jim and Kristen Hammond, they shared at the family service, and they were talking about marriage and family and those types of things. We, I mean, we just loved, uh, you know, what they talked about with regards to marriage and family. They were, they were transparent. You know, they were vulnerable. It was, yeah. it was refreshing. It was honest. It was, it was encouraging, you know. They didn't, they didn't approach it as though, you know, they had already arrived uh, or that they had it all figured out, okay. Um, but more that they had, a, you know, some things figured out uh, that have helped them, you know, yeah. enough that after years of struggles, at least they're at a place where they can now enjoy each other and enjoy being married. And I think a lot of us want to know that someone can relate, that somebody can relate to where we're at in life. They can relate to some of our struggles and our pain. And, you know, when I thought about this, the more I thought about this, I realized this isn't a new desire. This isn't something that's current to 2019. Right. I think this has been a part of who we are, part of our DNA, for all the way from the beginning. Right. And the good news is that uh, we have a God uh, that knows that about us, you yeah. know, and he can relate, you know. Um, we're going to look at Hebrews 4, 
uh, 14 and 15, if we can get that up there. Hebrews 4, 14 and 15. This is from the Living Bible. Okay? It says, uh, but Jesus, the Son of God, is our great high priest. Now, okay, I told you I grew up in the Catholic Church. You know, you have an impression of what a, the priest there is kind of like the intermediary between you and God or the, the people and God. He kind of serves as that. And of course, and the Old Testament priests were that way too. Um, praise God, Jesus is now our high priest. We don't need a man in the inner man. He, he came to be the man. And of course, he is the man. He's, he is not only uh, has a connection with God, he is God. He is the son of God. And uh, so he is now, you know, that's the position of the high priest. He's, he's, our, our, advocate. he's our advocate. Yeah. He's our intermediary, all right? He who has gone to heaven himself to help us. Therefore, let us never stop trusting him. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. Since he had the same temptations we do, though he never once gave way to them and sinned. Isn't that good news? Yeah. Same I mean, that's, stuff. That's our God. That's. Wow. That's the. Yeah. And he I, gets it. Yeah. And well, when I read this, you know, I, I realized that it started out with a but. So whenever I see that, I want to say, okay, what, what came before that? Like whenever I see that, I want to know what the verse is before. So I want to go back to verse 13. All right, and this is what verse 13 says. It says, God knows about everyone, everywhere. Everything about us is bare and wide open to all to see, or to the all-seeing eyes of our living God. Nothing can be hidden from him to whom we must explain all that we've done. Okay, when I read that one, I was kind of like, ouch. That makes me want to hide, right? That makes me want to go, man, I, I'm not ready for that level of transparency and yeah. vulnerability. Like he knows. Yeah. So again, I want to look at verses 14 and 15, and that's what makes these verses even more powerful. Because it's saying, okay, he sees everything, that we can't hide anything but Jesus. But Jesus, the Son of God, our high priest, who's gone to heaven itself to help us, so let's never stop trusting him. Because this high priest of ours, he understands our weaknesses because he had all the same temptations, though he never once gave in and he never once sinned. Okay, and then verse 16, this is when it really gets good. So let us come boldly to the very throne of God and stay there to receive his mercy, and to find grace to help us in our time of need. Yeah. Is that good news? Yeah. Listen to it in the, in the message. This is Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 from the message. Do we have it up there? Good. We don't have a high priest who's out of touch with our reality. That's good news. All right? He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he's so ready to give. Take the mercy. Accept the help. It's like exhorting you. <laughs> Take it. Yeah. Take it. You know, we have somebody that understands always. You know, God's saying, I see your mess, and I already paid for it. Right. So come to me. Let's talk. I'm right here, right now. God's... He's telling us it's okay to be transparent and vulnerable, yeah. okay? He already knows it anyway, okay? You're not hiding it from him, Yeah. all right? And he's not into guilt and shame and condemnation. Well, you're free from it. He's freed us from it. That's why we're up here. Yeah. That's why we're up here tonight, because we love to give freedom. We do. All right? And we want us it's what we love to do. all to see the freedom that we have and can have in Jesus. You know, again, when our sins, when we accept Jesus, our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. And that's amazing. But, you know, this isn't meant to give us permission to live however we want to live. It's meant to empower us. Right. You know, it gives us the freedom of a clean conscience and the freedom to come boldly to a loving, understanding, always 
present God who's always more than enough. You know, the Bible tells us that we can do all things through Christ. And it tells us also that three, through him we're more than conquerors. I mean, but God knows we won't come to him if we're stuck in uh, shame and condemnation. That's why he freed us from it. He did. You know, we're also parents. So when I think about this, I think about it as a parent. And I think about um, what that looks like in your kids, in our kids. When they mess up, what do they do? If they think they're going to get in trouble, what do they do? They try to cover it up. They try to hide it. I mean, when they're little, it might be candy wrappers under their bed or a broken plate, you know, behind the couch, something like that. But as they get older, I mean, bigger, um, bigger kids, bigger messes. Have you heard of that? <laughs> heard that? You know, then, you know, the mistakes that they might be making that they try and hide are bigger things. It might be relationship challenges that they're having, bad choices that they're making. But as parents, I mean, no matter how hard they try to hide it, we can still see it, right? Come on, mamas. You can see when they're messing up. It doesn't matter how well they think they're hiding it. That's why they think mom's got eyes in the back of their head, right? <laughs> yeah. You know. Yep. We might not know exactly what they're hiding, but we know that they're hiding something. And I know that I'd much rather that they came to me when they messed up because I know how much I love them and I know that I can help them no matter what's going on. I mean, that's why, you know, God wants to make it crystal clear that he sees it all, he knows how hard it is, so he stepped in and took away our sin, okay? Yeah. He gave us a clean slate so that we can always come boldly, no matter what kind of mess, you know, we've made for ourselves or that we find ourselves yeah. in. Because just like any good parent, I mean, he wants to be the first one we come to and he wants us to know that we're safe to receive all the help that we need. So this is our heart for you, and this is why we do what we do. So, you know, maybe some of you haven't heard, of, heard us uh, share before, but for years, whether it's been through Marriage Matters, which we lead, and Girls of Grace, which she leads, and, or even more recently, I've spoken at Manhood a couple times, we really try to be transparent, you know, uh, and vulnerable, and, and share in that way, you know. We don't share our struggles to glorify them, you know, uh, but we just want you to know you're not alone, okay? Yeah. You know, and the Bible tells us that it, it um, God doesn't show favoritism, you know. Pastor Mack will say he's no respecter of persons from the King James, but he doesn't have favorites. So if, he, if he's helped John and Lisa Bevere through some of their stuff, guess what? He's going to help you. If he's helped Jim and Kristen with their struggles, guess what? He's going to help you. If he's helped, you know, Charlie and Stacy get over themselves a few times, guess what? A few. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to do the same for you. <laughs> well, and for those of you who don't know our background, uh, we are uh, not the most likely candidates to run a marriage group. Uh, <laughs> The resume is not good, okay? Uh, maybe we're even the least qualified. I'm not sure. Um, my background, I... I uh, what? No, I just said you covered it some, oh. but go ahead. Yeah, well, my background, I, I told you a little bit about my family, but we, uh, we had six kids. I was the fifth of six kids. My mom gave birth to six kids in less than seven years with no twins. So when the sixth one was born, the first one wasn't seven yet. So it was, a, it was a crazy household. But like I said, my parents were married for uh, nearly 60 years. We had a very stable household. Um, we, uh, as I said, faithful Catholic family. Uh, I'll have to admit that um, my church experience, since I, I went to church, but I didn't know the Lord. So I... I'll honestly tell you, I didn't get anything out of it. Um, it was like Pastor Mac talks about punching the religious time clock. I guess that's what I did uh, growing up. And when I got old enough to have my driver's license, uh, the church didn't see me so much anymore. <laughs> so, uh, and I lived a you know very worldly life. Um, my thoughts on God were, well, I don't know, I don't know if he's 
is or if he isn't, and I don't really think it matters. It doesn't affect my life. That's kind of where as much conversation as I could have about God because, like, who cares, you know? Um, and I lived a worldly life. I got married when I was uh, 22 years old. I got divorced when I was 30. Uh, and then two years after that is when I came to know the Lord. So, you know, there's my resume for being... Um, qualified to talk about marriage. Pretty good, huh? Let's hear it for, for me. Yeah. Okay, and, and me on the other hand, I mean, I came from a broken home, and I mean, it was hard. Um, my parents stopped going to church when I was really young. I remember going when, we were, I, when I was pretty little bitty, but when they started having problems, that was the first thing to go. My mom was only 18 when she had my sister. She was 20 when she had me. So, you know, she didn't have a lot of parenting skills. She didn't have uh, a lot of resources from her family. They were disappointed with her choices. Um, you know, and honestly, growing up, I didn't feel loved. You know, looking back, it's easy for me to see, okay, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. My parents loved me, but I never felt it growing up. So, you know, I'm not going to go into all the details of my childhood, but... Um, it left me with a lot of really destructive behaviors. I went to college and I struggled with alcohol. I struggled with relationships, um, even battled an eating disorder. So what about those, what, what was your philosophy on men back then, by the way? <laughs> Can you tell, uh, what about those he unhealthy? Thinks, he thinks this is pretty funny. Well, you might okay. too. Well, you might, you might too. All right, so my philosophy on men when I was single was that they were like computers. Every eight months you need to upgrade. <laughs> now, how does that look on your healthy marriage resume? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're extremely qualified to, uh, to talk about marriage. And Remember family. what I said earlier, but God, right? Yeah. <laughs> but Jesus. So thankfully, um, I did become a Christian when I was 25. And, you know, really for me was a radical transformation. I ended up, I mean, of all things, I ended up at a church camp in Canada. Like, it's a crazy, awesome story. Um, but during the next 10 days, I got born again, water baptized, um, and I came back home almost unrecognizable. Then I ended up coming up here to Minnesota, Living Word, met Charlie a couple weeks after that. So it was like a year later I met Charlie. Um, I still didn't have a very strong foundation in the Word, but I loved God, so right. that was a good start. And Stacy and I ended up getting married about, about a year later. And yeah. we kind of thought we had, you know, kind of had the marriage thing figured out. <laughs> He'd made his yeah. mistakes. I learned from my family's mistakes. We got oh, yeah. this down. We, got, we, we really know what we're doing now, you know. <laughs> at least we thought we did, you know. I, thankfully, we started attending a marriage group here at, at uh, church, and, and it helped, you know. Uh, but we still ended up crashing pretty hard about three years in. Yeah, I mean, I still remember standing out on our um, deck looking at Charlie and saying, you know what, I don't even like you. I don't like you. I know what divorce feels like. I'm not going through that. I'm not, I'm not doing that to our kids, but I'm done. I'll manage this like a business partnership, but I have absolutely no feelings for you. And I meant day. it. You know, it wasn't a threat. I wasn't trying to get him to wake up. I was done. I'd been trying to do that for a year. I totally, I was done. It was a great day, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was... A, well past eight months. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there had been a, a crazy amount of pressure on Stacy. You know, my, my daughter at the time was 15 and living with us, and we had a one-and-a-half-year-old. She was still working full-time, and I was gone a lot, a lot. My schedule had me gone a lot on evenings and weekends, and, you know, I really wanted to, I, I really wanted to good jo do a good job in my work and in ministry, and, and uh but I, without realizing it, I had put work and ministry uh, above her, and, yeah. and that wasn't working. Yep. Well, we're going to spare you all the ugly details because there were a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, I'd gotten to the point where I was so resentful of everything that took his time and attention. I was so jealous that I became toxic. I mean, 
there was nothing, by that point, there was nothing that he could do right. And thankfully, I mean, I actually got to the point where I couldn't stand myself. I couldn't even stand my own thoughts. And that's when I finally asked God for help. You know, I, when I asked him for help, I thought he was going to change Charlie. Mm. That's always what we want, right? We, want, mm -hmm. we always want him to change the other person. Oh, whether, God, change yeah. my spouse. <laughs> but that's not what he did. He actually... Um, you know, John and Lisa shared their story a little bit, and he kind of did the same thing with me that he did to John, with John Bevere. He said, you know, I want you to take this journal, and I want you to write down everything that you're thankful for about your husband. And I did that. I started writing down all the things that I was thankful for about Charlie, and it just broke that toxic pattern of thinking that I had created. And the funny thing to me is I only wrote in that journal one time, but it was still enough. It was what I needed to break those thoughts. Right. Okay, so all this has just really been background to what we want to get into tonight. So. <laughs> yeah. And I anyway. where we are. Okay, sorry, I forgot where we were. I was well, like into the story, but I'm, yeah. I'm there now. I'm do tracking you, now. Do you I'm have good. more of that story that you want to... No. Do you have more of that story you want to put out there? Then? No, I think okay. I'm good. All right. You know, there were um, so many different ways. Like Charlie said, this was just kind of background to get into what we really wanted to share. And all of that was awesome and important and just really wanted to show you, kind of give you a background on who we are. Um, and there's so many ways that we could have moved into this part. But the way that I felt led... But I'll just say this. So now that you know that, if you don't like what we talk about tonight, you can just disregard it because we're not qualified anyway. <laughs> Stop. So you're free to... Okay, okay well, <laughs> um, this weekend, or what I, the way I felt led to get into it was this weekend, Pastor Mac um, shared some things at the services. He shared that he felt as a church that we've been in the land of just enough. And he knows, he feels that the Lord has directed him that we're going to be moving into a time of more than enough. And he, he compared it to the Israelites, right? He said that, you know, first they were in Egypt, they were in the land of not enough. And as they traveled through the wilderness, they moved into the land of just enough. And yep. they finally moved into the promised land where they, had the, they were in the land of more than enough, right? And so on Monday, he asked us as a staff to think about, like, what would it look like to live in the land of more than enough? Yeah. Like, think about what your promised land would look like. And I want you guys to think about that for a minute. Yeah. What would your promised land look like? Yeah. And we've heard Pastor Mac, you know, talk like, you know, if the Lord gave him a million or five million or 500 million or anything in between, you know, he knows exactly what he would use it for, you know, because he has goals. He has a vision, Right. You know, and I know for us, this land of more than enough, this promised land, it wouldn't just be about financial freedom. For us, it's going to cover a lot of other areas, right? And, you know, we're guessing it's probably the same for you guys because it's a lot harder to enjoy that land of more than enough if your relationships are a mess. Right. Or if you haven't been taking care of your health. I mean, it's harder to enjoy the promised land from that position. Yeah. So one thing about us is, you know, yes, we like to, as we mentioned earlier, we want to uh, bring you freedom, all right, in Christ, but we also want to give you practical help on how to do that, you know. Most of us, you know, most of us know that it's important to have a vision, yeah. right? Uh, that it's important to have goals, but a lot of us don't really know what that looks like, okay? Yeah. And some of us do know what we think it's supposed to look like, but it can feel too hard. It kind of feels overwhelming at times, right? Yeah. You know, again, we're guessing that you've heard how important it is to have a vision for your lives, how important it is to set goals, and we also know that most of us aren't doing it. Am I right? I mean, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but if we all know that and we're not doing it, there's got to be a reason, and we get it. Yeah, I mean... We've read the books. You know, I've read a lot of them. Many of us know that, you know, the goal setting steps to success, right? Along with all the statistics about how successful we'd be if we, 
if we did those, you know, step one, step two, step three, right? And honestly, you know, I felt like we were doing a lousy job, you know? I felt like when it came to setting goals, I, I've been being lazy because according to the books I've read, you know, we're not doing it the way they said to do it. All we're not right? doing it right. <laughs> right. We're not doing it right, okay? But when we started, you know, thinking about and brainstorming about, about this message, Stacy wrote some notes, and I was surprised at some of the things she pointed out that we've done over the years, the goals we've set, you know, the vision we've had for different areas of our lives, and I don't know, kind of the light bulb went on. It's not that we haven't been setting goals, okay? It's not that we don't have a vision for the different areas of our life. It's just that our process and result looks different than the books we've read, yeah. okay? But for us, it, it hasn't been any less successful, so we wanted to look at some of the reasons, you know, that we're not setting goals and look at, you know, the ways that we can get past the obstacles that are holding us back. So what is stopping us? Okay. I mean, the answer is probably different for each of us. So we're going to look at some of the common, you know, stumbling blocks, the things that hold us back, you know, starting with what's often stopped us. Okay. So as we thought about it, I realized that I drag my feet um, about setting goals or about planning because the process is so different for each of us. You know, it's for, yeah. so hard to even have a conversation about it for us. Even the pace of the conversation is different. Like, I think and I talk fast, and when I get excited about something, I can rattle off ideas, I can get really excited about whatever I'm dreaming about, whatever I'm planning, whatever goals I have, and I can rattle it off really quick. And I'm, and I'm more of a processor, you know? When you see that little thing spinning on your computer, right? that's, that's my face when, when she's, you know, rallying. The, I need time to think about it, all right? I want to process each one, and I want, to make a, I want to make a plan, you know? Some of you are like, hey, I, I relate to this guy. Yep. <laughs> you know, it, and that's... Fabulous, but unfortunately, it totally shuts me down. Like, I've already had six conversations before it's even spun around the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, so here's an example for Spaghetti us. Spaghetti brain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, we need new flooring, okay? Our house is 25 years old, and I'm guessing our linoleum is too, and most of our carpet. Um, and for me, I can tell. So what does my brainstorming session look like? It's all about like seeing it. It's all about touching it. It's all about like getting a vision for what I want. Again, I want to think about it. I want to visualize it. And she's really good at that. I mean, she actually can see it in her mind and I actually see nothing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I want to plan, man. I want to know how much, like, you know, how much time, how much money, you know, who's going to do it. You know, when could we possibly do it, you know? Anyway. You know, the goal here should be no new flooring, right? I mean, it should be simple, but I put it right back on the shelf because I don't have all the answers that I think that Charlie needs. You know, who's going to do it? When are they going to do it? You know, I don't, I don't want to think about that stuff. I just want new flooring. Let's go check it out. Let's have some fun with this. <laughs> and so I just don't like how different our process is. No, I mean, like... Okay, talk about like marriage stuff, like flooring can seem like a silly example, right? But, you know, if we can see what our stumbling blocks are in the areas that we're less emotional about and a little less passionate about, it'll help us understand the areas that we have a lot more emotion attached to it. Because, you know, it can be harder to break down our stumbling blocks when we're talking about parenting and discipline, when we're talking about finances or, you know, whatever area is sensitive for you guys. I mean, if you're married, you know you're different, right? Okay. You guys know that, yeah. right? And having goals together can be harder than having individual goals because we have to wade through our, you know, our different, sometimes clashing opinions, right? Well, another obstacle for setting goals is that we often overcomplicate it. Again, you know, we complicate the process with our clashing opinions instead of staying focused on the goals. 
you know, my default has been to try to set goals according to the book, you know, write One them out, step, two make step, a detail, three you know, step, the smart, four step. what is it, uh, attainable, measurable, you know, because, you know, that's what I've read, you know, that's the right way to do it, right? And again, that does not work for me. I want to talk about it. So he pulls out a notebook and I'm done. This goal setting session is officially over. I'm out. <laughs> have fun. So you got, we have different personalities, right? You know, we also have different learning styles even. Um, you know, we're not going to go into detail on this. I want to just tell you, share with you real quickly about the different learning styles. Because here's the thing, if we don't know some of these things, you know, personality types are really popular right now. And the reason they're popular is because it helps us to figure ourselves out. It helps us to figure out our families. It helps right. us to figure other people out. And again, um, one of the things that I found that helped me to kind of understand how we process goals and visions was understanding you know, our learning styles and understanding that they're different. So whether you're married or not, knowing these are still going to help. So here's my 30-second glimpse into the four learning styles. Now you're going to see my homeschool mom hat on right here. There we go. Um, but the first is reading and writing. I mean, if this is your learning style, okay, like my husband, you might like those detailed lists. That might be your go-to, and you may want detailed plans about all you're believing for. There are also kinesthetic learners. These are the hands-on learners. I mean, they might, um, it might work best for them to talk about their goals when they're moving. Um, so they may process best talking at the gym, out on a walk, or even the process for them of making a vision board can be helpful. Okay, then there's visual learners. You know, they're most inspired by looking at a vision board. Have somebody else, have one of those kinesthetic learners create your vision board for you. I don't know. Um, or just get some pictures and put them on your mirror, put them on your refrigerator. I remember when my sister knew she was um, going to be building a house, she got a three-ring binder, and she just started collecting things that she liked, and that's what she needed. You know, some of us are auditory learners. We like talking about our goals. We like talking about what inspires us. So then we have to take time to talk about what we're believing for, where we see ourselves a year from now or five years from now. You know, as couples, again, our learning styles are often different, so we'll have to help each other out by doing what works, you know, not just for ourselves, but also what works for them. Well, another big stumbling block for a lot of people in doing goals and vision is, is fear of failure. Yeah. It's a biggie, you know. Sometimes we don't set goals because we don't like to deal with the feeling of not hitting them. You know, We've, think about New Year's resolutions. I mean, how many gave those up 10 years ago because you never actually hit one of those resolutions? Yeah. <laughs> <One>. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, we don't like feeling shame or feeling like we're failing, you know. But this is something we've got to get through, and it can start actually by, we can actually set goals that are too small to fail. You know, there's a pastor at a church in Montana named Levi Lusco. He did a message on setting goals that are so small that we can't fail, and the reason being because it will start us having a, uh, developing a habit of success. Changes the way we think. Helps us develop a mindset of succeeding instead of failing. His example actually was talking about exercise. He says, let's set a goal of doing one push-up a day. Okay, that sounds maybe kind of ridiculous, but the truth is, you know, when we do that, we're, we're probably going to do more once we get down there. Right. If you'd spend all <laughs> you know? that time to get down to the floor, you're going to do two or three, maybe even five. But you, you actually don't feel like you're failing. You know, yep. you might chuckle at that, but you need a starting point. Yeah. And you start at a place where you know you can't fail. Okay. Yep. Um, you know, this may seem to go against our, you know, dream big philosophy, but it doesn't have to. It's a starting point. Yeah, I mean, you can still have a big dream, but take a small step right. to get started. Okay, sometimes it's our fear of conflict that stops us. You know, we don't talk about our goals with our spouse because, you know what, we're afraid we're going to disagree. I'm sorry to tell you, you probably will. Mm -hmm. And you're probably going to have some conflict. You know, ultimately, our goals are designed to actually reduce conflict but we'll probably have to face some conflict in the process. You know, and we get, again, we get that it's hard. For us, 
This is always embarrassing to say. It took us three years to create a budget. Three years. We knew we needed a budget. We knew we wanted a budget. We're not talking about the three years before we actually decided to make a budget yeah, when we knew. We're talking about from the <laughs> day that we decided, okay, we're going to create a budget. It, yeah. it three took years. us three years to agree on something. But you know why? It was three years because we had to work through what our priorities were. Yeah. That's where the challenge was. That's where the hard work of creating a budget is. It's just a plan about your financial priorities. Yeah. And we had to, you know, we had, took us three years to settle on what our financial priorities were going to be. We had to weigh out what was important to us, you know, and there was conflict and there was tears. You know, the funniest one to me was over my $20 a month Starbucks budget. Like, Charlie was like, seriously, you don't need this. We have a coffee pot. You're good. Yeah. And to I me, was it was like, coffee's coffee, right? And I was in tears in the kitchen. And he's like, seriously, Starbucks is that important to you that you're crying over it? And what I had to realize was that was my, fr that was my time with my girlfriends. That was my time where I got out of the house and away from the kids. That was my break. That I was thought when it was I just got coffee. <laughs> But it took us a while to get there for me to really realize, because at first I was embarrassed, really, is, is coffee this important to me? But then when I realized really what it meant to me was deeper than that. Right. And it really helped us to get through it. I mean, it, it did. And that was like, okay, once she said that, it was like, oh, okay. Well, we're, he we're, gave me my $20. We're not cutting it, you know. <laughs> we'll just not pay the electricity. That's not, you know. <laughs> You know, but the point is, you know, conflict isn't always bad. It's okay to have to, to get uncomfortable also. You know, even if it's your own budget, it's okay to have to make some of those uncomfortable decisions and figure out why. What is really going on? Why am I uncomfortable about this? Right, right. And, you know, you know it isn't because we have so much money that, you know, we've figured things out, but... We just have the same goals now. Yeah, you know? yeah. Because again, since um, making that budget, we honestly don't have conflict anymore. And like Charlie said, it's not because um, it's not because we have so much money. It's because we have the same goals. Right. Okay. Next, we want to look at getting our goals out of the box. And this was the big one. This was the one that why Charlie didn't realize he was like, we don't have goals. Yeah, I remember how I said that. I said I felt like we were doing a lousy job of, you know setting goals and and i feel like i've been lazy about it well the reason is my thoughts about goal setting were in that traditional box and stacy and i just didn't we just didn't fit in to that box you know it was my so, fault listen we're not saying by the way make it really clear we're not saying that the traditional goal setting is wrong no not okay? at all uh, it works amazingly well for those that'll do it it does okay all but, three percent of them yeah the statistics say that what <laughs> Three percent, right? You guys read this? Three percent. Three percent. Other people are doing it. Okay. So I mean, it works. It works great. They're the most successful people but, in the country and in the world. Right. So but if works. we're not doing it, it ain't working for us. <laughs> you know. So sometimes we have to think outside of the box to find what does work. Like what really works for us. And for us, what works is to keep it simple. Right. So we want to share with you some of, the, some of the areas in our life that we've set goals. Not to tell you what your goals should be. No. Okay? Not to tell you what your goals should be, in case you didn't hear me the first time, <laughs> but to share what's helped us to keep moving in the same direction, okay? Now remember, we're trying to get in the promised land here. We're trying to look at that where we want to be. So what are our goals? How are we going to get there? You know, so that we stop spinning our wheels out in the wilderness. Right. We don't have to do that. So the, the first area is finances, which we've talked about some already. You know, we had an overriding goal for our finances of being uh, debt-free. Okay? We were going to stay debt-free. Now, we do have a mortgage, but outside of that, we have been debt-free for a long time. But this is, a, this is a guiding goal principle for our you know, if we, if we have to get something, if we have to go in debt to get something, we already know the answer. The answer is no, it ain't going to yeah. happen. So you know, that's a guiding, that's a goal, that's a guiding principle, you know. You, you know, the other um, financial goal that we have, um, we've been chuckled at about this, but really our goal is that we're not a burden for our kids. 
And what that means is we have to plan now. We can't spend everything that comes in because we, want, we don't want 40 years from now for them to have to take care of us financially. They might have to take care of us physically, but you know, <laughs> we want to at least have that taken care of so we don't spend everything and we make a plan. You know, and, and again, this might sound like we're staying in the land of just enough, but we're always believing for more. Right. We have a plan for any excess that comes in. We know our vision, we know our goals. We wanna go to Israel, we wanna, we do want new vehicles. We want, you know, and we just put away all the extra. We have percentages set aside already planned out for that too. Right. We have goals for parenting. Um, we wanna raise healthy, independent adults that love God. Is that, so, is that too oversimplified? I mean, you know, when the end of the day, if your kids are, healthy, independent adults and they love God and God's got a plan for their life, they're probably going to be successful, right? Yeah. And you know what? That, that means it also, again, directs our choices. My goal is not that they have the most fun summer of their life. I want them to be healthy, independent adults. So what does that look like? You know, and it just, again, it helps us to make Sometimes decisions. Sometimes it means we have to say no a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Education. We have an education goal for our kids. We, our goal is that they love to learn. Period. Again, it sounds really simple, and there are different seasons that, that looks different. You know, we've done public school, we've done private school, I've done homeschool. I've got one that's homeschooled right now and one that's at Maranatha. You know, it looks different even for us, for each kid. I mean, you might, some people may have a goal for their kids to, to go to college or to get a, a scholarship, scholarship or whatever. Yep. And, and, uh, you know, we kind of, if, if that's your goal, that's great, okay? Yep. I mean, we're not, for us, we just, we want kids that love to learn. If they can walk away from their educational life and they love to learn, and, and God, God's got a plan for their life, there is nothing that can stop them. Yep, yep. And again, remember, we're just trying to help you to think outside of the box. We're not trying to tell you what your goals should be. I mean, God's called, equipped, and anointed you to raise your own kids, and their plan is different right. than our kids' plan, and that's okay. So in other areas is our health, you know. Um, we have a goal for our health to stay active and at a healthy weight. That was, you know, something we felt strongly about from before we were married. But the funny thing is, I mean, how we reach that goal Again, completely different. Right. For Charlie, that means he has a gym membership. For me, that means I do eight push-ups a day and I go for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it, it, the same goal, but different ways of accomplishing it. Yeah, so, you know, we don't have a, we didn't have to have a, a goal where we both go to the gym three times a week and that, is there something wrong with that? No. It just There's doesn't not. work for it us. Doesn't work it for doesn't us. work for me right yeah. now. Maybe it will once our kids are gone. I don't yeah. know. Um, spiritual, our spiritual goal, our goal is that we continue to grow in our relationship with God. You know, some people have a goal of how much time they spend in the Word, that, or how much time they spend in prayer. I would be so distracted by my timer that I would have no, I, you know, I would well, totally if lose. If you do that, that's great, by the right. way. Okay. Again, I'm just, just saying, for me, that isn't something that works. And again, this looks different for each of us. If our goal is that we grow in our relationship with God, for, for me, a lot of times that means I'm listening to the Bible on my phone. I'm an auditory learner. I felt guilty about that for years because I wasn't always opening my Bible. But you know what? That's my learning style. That's how I learn best. Yeah. So again, that's why it's good to kind of know yourself, know some things about you, and know what works for you. Uh, in the area of our intellectual lives, we have decided, we decided before we're married that we both want to be lifelong learners. That's our goal. We're going to be lifelong learners. We're never going to want to reach a point in our life where it's like, meh, I kind of know it all. <laughs> you know, we, we are going, and not only that, but we will make effort, you know, to do that. Yeah, it means we're going to read books. I mean, I, I was thinking about this. I could not tell you anything I learned in college, so... Praise God that I've chosen to continue learning because I've never, I haven't pulled any of those, that information out and used it um, in my life. Okay, family goals. Um, you know, I don't know. We're just like everybody else. We can be pulled in a million different directions. There's things always vying for our time, our attention, and our focus. And for us, it's family first. Right. I mean, one of the ways that we uh, wanted to put our family first is by having a yearly vacation. 
Okay, you know? that's one of the ways that Charlie wanted to put our family first, was by having a family vacation. Um, that really wasn't something that I felt that I needed, because it, it was actually a battle for me. Another thing that Lisa and um, that John Bevere shared was that he defers to Lisa 99% of the time. The only time he doesn't defer to her is when he sees fear. And this was an area that I had fear, because I couldn't see spending money. I couldn't see spending time. I didn't know how we were going to do it. Right. And Charlie was like, no, this is important to me. So yeah. it became a goal for us. And it did. And we've done it. And you should tell, how do you feel about it now? I feel great. We got to keep oh. moving. We're oh. getting, All right. we got a clock there that's, <laughs> yeah, we've got a goal of being done at 830 and we've got way too many words yeah, left got... to say. So we're going to move on. Okay. Um, we have a goal for our marriage. And again, talk about simple. We read a book by Danny Silk called um, Keep, Your, Keep Love Your Love On. And in that book, he said, there are only two goals for marriage. You're either connecting on purpose. Your goal is either connection, connection or on purpose, or your, your goal is disconnection. And you're disconnecting by default. You're either working to maintain a safe a connection, safe connection. Or you're working to maintain a safe, safe distance. distance yeah. And I don't know about you, but that made it really simple for me. Our goal for marriage is connection. And we have learned to recognize when we're disconnected. We've learned that if he's bugging me, we need a date. Yeah. <laughs> you know, our goal has not been connection. If he's on my nerves or if I'm on his nerves, something's, some, there's, not, there's something broken in that connection. Yeah. And beyond that, now, our overarching number one goal, really, for our, over all of those things is to be an influence for God. Yep. That's what we feel like we were born for. That's what we feel like what you were born for, yep. is that you were born to be an influence for God. We were put here for, you know, on purpose, for a purpose, and that's, you know, that, that manifests in a lot of ways, you know, but it doesn't mean that we always put church ahead of family. Right. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. Yep. You know, there's lots of ways that we can be an influence for God. We all have different giftings. We all have different talents. Um, you know, it can sh for us, it can mean that we show up early for church to greet people or that Charlie pr plows a neighbor or two's driveway. You know, I read Ephesians 5, 1 through 2 in the message, and it really sums up what we see influence look like. It says, watch, this is, yeah, Ephesians 5, 1 through 2 in the message, watch what God does, and then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents, mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us, love like that. You know, we said that we weren't the most qualified to lead a marriage ministry. Actually, when we are a marriage group, when we were asked to step into leadership there, I really humbly went to God and I said, why us? Like, it doesn't even make sense. Yeah, check why, your resume, God. Yeah, why it's us? Not good. And what he, what he said to me was so simple. He's like, because you'll love them. And I was like, yep. We can do that. We can do that. That was the one thing that we could do. Yeah. You know, one thing I like about our goals is they allow so much room for grace for each other and for our differences. So again, we're not saying you need to do this our way, but you need to find what works for you. And that might not be easy to find, but you'll grow together through it, even if it's hard, yep. you know. And hey, having goals helps us when things get tough. Yeah. You know, parenting gets hard. Uh, and it's hard to make tough decisions. It's hard to say no, but in those times, if we're remembering our goal, it keeps us focused on the result. Same with our finances, with our health, any area. Keeping the goal in mind well, is always going to help us make those tougher decisions. You know, and I want to close by sharing one last thought. You know, by simplifying our goals, it's allowed a lot more room for God to be God in our lives and in our marriage. Jeremiah 29, 11, in the Good News Translation says, I know... I alone know the plans I have for you, plans to bring you prosperity and not disaster, plans to bring about a future that you hope for. You know, God and God alone knows the plans that he has for us. Looking back, you know, it was never 
our goal for Charlie to be a pastor at Living Word. Our goal was simply to be an influence for God, period. And then he filled in all the details. We mentioned for years that one of our goals was have a yearly family vacation. And when we first decided to do this, as she said, she was in fear. The only two things we knew was this. Number one, we had no budget for a vacation. None. Zero. No. No, no pennies in our budget for it. And number two, I can't sleep on the ground in a tent. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work for my body. It's not happening. Okay? <laughs> Ain't going to happen. So. so, you know, it left a lot of room for God to be God. Again, Jeremiah 29, 11, his plans are good and not for evil. And his plans for us have been so good and so out of the box, you so, know. So what, we, what we had is somebody that we knew that offered to let us use their cabin on a lake in northern Minnesota. Anytime we Anytime wanted. Anytime we wanted. We, we'd, we'd take a week and go up there. We had weekends. We had many times. Yeah. We became kids, very good friends of ours and... You know, God just blessed us with yeah. that, you know? Yeah, it was awesome. So if you've been coming to Living Word for a while, I'm sure you've heard Pastor Max share Habakkuk 2, 2, write the vision and make it plain. Well, I want you to listen to Habakkuk 2, 1 through 3, and this is in the Good News translation. It says, I will climb my watchtower and wait to see what the Lord will tell me to say and what answer he'll give to my complaint. The Lord gave me this answer. Write down clearly on tablets what I reveal to you so that it can be read at a glance. Okay, so it says write it down clearly so that it can be read at a glance. Okay, to me, this doesn't sound like the detailed, complicated vision that I've always thought of with this verse, right? This sounds like an outline. I think God wants to paint in all the details for us. All right, I want to read verse 3, and then we're going to have to let it's you guys out of here. Um, verse 3, it says, put it in writing because it's not yet time for it to come to pass, but the time is coming quickly, and what I show you will come true. It may seem slow in coming, but wait for it. It will clearly take place, and it will not be delayed. You know, so often when things don't happen, when we think that they should, or when we think that they should, or, you know, we can get, um, we can get discouraged if they don't happen right. the way that we think they should or when we think they should. We get discouraged, and that's why I love to write things down. I mean, when we're believing for something, I do like to write it down, usually one or three words. It's really short. And I make that list, and because I know I'm going to lose it. She does. I'm going to lose yeah. it. I'm not kidding. And I'm going to find it four years from now. Yeah. And I'm going to be really excited because I'm going to see all the things that, you know, they seem slow in coming, but they surely came okay. to pass. <laughs> it's so true. But that's why I like writing them down. All right. Well, just to wrap up, we want you guys to have a vision for what your land of more than enough looks like. Yeah. And our hope for tonight was to make it easier for you to have goals without getting all stuck and jammed up in process, okay? Yep, so let's figure out what's stopping us from having goals, and let's get our goals out of the box so we can find what works for us.